first thing that happens is that there is a sense as though all the air in the room had been sucked out. All the colors brighten. This is that increase in visual acuity. All edges become sharp. Distant things stand out in their clarity. This is at one toque. At two toques, you close your eyes. You feel a sense of anesthesia seeping through your body. You close your eyes and you see a floral pattern rotating in space, usually yellow-orange. People who do this occasionally, and nobody does it a lot, call it the chrysanthemum. It's a floral pattern, like a pattern in a Chinese brocade. This forms and stabilizes, and then you either break through it, or you require one more toque. So, you take, let us assume, a third toque, long and slow, through a glass pipe. You vaporize this stuff, and you take it in and in and in, and there is definitely somewhere in here a threshold, a threshold which you must exceed. And when you do that, this membrane-like thing, this chrysanthemum, will actually part and there is a sound uh, like the crumpling of a plastic bread wrapper or the crackling of flame. A friend of mine says, this is the radio intellecti of your soul exiting through the anterior fontanelle at the top of your head. Uh, could be. In any case, this crackling sound and a tone, a tone, a Then there's this impression of transition, and you're now 20 seconds deep into this experience. There's an impression of transition. There, it's as though there were a series of tunnels or chambers that you are tumbling down, being propelled by some kind of muscle behind you that is pushing you. I mean, yes, birth canal, yes, yes, of course. But anyway, a tunnel, and what I've noticed about this tunnel is the walls and ceiling flux and come down to meet each other, and where they touch, they pull apart with a... And then you're propelled into the next space, and then the next, and then you are there. Where is there? It's underground. How you know this, you cannot say, but there is an irreconcilable sense of enormous mass surrounding you. In other words, you are underground. You're at the center of a mountain or something, and you're in a room which aficionados call the dome, and people will ask each other, did you see the dome? Were you there? And the... Uh, the walls, if such they be, are crawling with geometric hallucinations, uh, very brightly colored, very iridescent, with deep sheens and very high reflective surfaces. Everything is machine-like and polished and throbbing with energy, but that is not what immediately arrests my attention. What arrests my attention is the fact that this space is inhabited. That the immediate impression as you break into it is there is a cheer. You break in to this space and are immediately swarmed by squeaking, self-transforming elf machines. These things which are made of light and grammar and sound that come chirping and squealing and tumbling toward you and they say hooray welcome you're here and my uh, my immediate impression no matter how many times i do this and i've done it maybe 30 or 40 times which isn't a lot in a lifetime of worshiping it my immediate impression is that 
they are welcoming. One of the strange things about DMT is that it does not affect your mind in the ordinary sense in that, you know, drugs, they make you giggly, they frighten you, they stimulate you, they depress you. DMT does none of this. You go to that place with all your groceries. You're there and you're there thinking, Jesus H fucking Christ, what is this? What is it? And there, it, because, and you're thinking, you know, I must be dead. I've done it this time. I, I must be dead. And so you, you know, you, you think heart, heart, yes, mm, heart, mm, mm, mm. pulse, pulse, yes, yes. And meanwhile, these things are literally in your face. And what they do is they jump into your chest and then they jump out again. And what they're doing, and this is the point, I think, what they're doing is they are singing, chanting, speaking in some kind of language that is very bizarre to hear. But what is far more important is that you can see it. They speak in a language which you see. And this is completely confounding because syntax is not something you ordinarily reach out and touch. And in this space, that's what's happening. And so like jewel self-dribbling basketballs, these things come running forward. And what they are doing with this visible language that they create is they're making gifts. They're making gifts for you. And they will say, which condenses as something which looks like a cross between a sock with camel, a Havana cigar, a piece of abalone, an opal, and a nookie. And they offer it to you. And you're looking at this thing. And as you look at it, it also transforms, changes, speaks, sings, uh, undergoes metastasis, undergoes metamorphosis, and these things are just accumulating. And each elf machine creature elbows others aside, says, look at this, look at this, take this, choose me. This state of incredible frenzy goes on for about three minutes, and all the time the elves are saying, don't give way to wonder. Do not abandon yourself to amazement. Pay attention. Pay attention. Look at what we're doing. Look at what we're doing. And then do it. Do it. And it, it's this thing where then everything stops. And they wait. And you feel like a, a torch. A spark lit in your belly that begins to move up your esophagus. And eventually when it reaches your mouth, your mouth just flies open. And this language-like stuff comes out. Acoustically, it's but what you're you're not hearing the startled friends who sent you to this place are putting up with this. What you're experiencing is a visual modality where these tones are surfaces, shading, colors, insets, jewels. You are making something. <laughs> You know, erase, move forward, add cerulean, put in stippling. It's that sort of thing. And, um, and they go mad with joy. 
when you do this. So, this is an experience which in some form, I mean it will be different for each one of you, but in some form, at least what will be similar to my description is how dramatic it will be. It will hit you as hard as it hit me if you do it right. This, to me, this experience is of a fundamentally different order than any other experience this side of the yawning grave. And why religions have not been built around it, why empires have not risen and fallen around the control of its sources, why theology has not enshrined it as its central exhibit for the presence of the other in the human world, I don't know. I can tell the secret. As you notice, nothing shuts me up. But a long, long time ago, I took an oath to tell all secrets that came my way. So how can it be then that a compound which each of us carries right here, right in the pineal gland, right in the Ajna Chakra, the Philosopher's Stone is no further away than that. How can this be secret from us? How can we be trapped in a dimension of such limitation and such mundaneness when our own nervous systems and the ecology around us and our own history over the past half million years argues that this is what we were born and bred for. This is where we belong. This is what that play in the fields of the goddess must mean. And somehow history has uh, made us dysfunctional, buried the mystery, made it, a, a, if at best, a piece of secret knowledge jealously guarded by somebody. I mean, I don't know. There are lots of mystery cults and secret societies in the world. I don't know if any of them are guarding DMT as a secret. I, I, it may be so. No one told me to keep my mouth shut. If this is not the secret that these lineages are guarding, then they're guarding an empty house. This is the secret. <laughs>